Ibi, Sunt, Leones. This is a Latin phrase that means there be lines. This phrase was used many years ago when men began making maps of the world. They used it whenever there was unknown territory or terra incognita. Ibi Sunt Leones was used to represent many parts of Africa and the line metaphor was used to warn those who would want to explore that there might be unknown dangers. But clearly, this was not a case of unknown territory, but simply unknown history from those who were making the map. So today, we will look at why properly understanding and knowing the history of Africa is of the utmost importance if you want to build a better future for humanity, a future with real sisterhood and brotherhood between all the people, the people of Africa and the people of the world. So I say yes, Africa is where lions be. Let's get to work. Hey family, welcome to Afrikili. As a reminder, the word Afrikili is a contraction between the words Africa and Akili, uh, which means intelligence uh, in the Swahili language, the most spoken language uh, in Africa. So Afrikili stands for African Intelligence. Uh, if you have been reading our blog online at www.africili.com, you know that Afrikili advocates for the creation uh, of a federal United States of Africa by focusing on three pillars, uh, an African history, business, and political action. So today, we will focus specifically on history. Why is it important to know the real past and contemporary history of Africa if you want to build a better future for all of humanity? Now, before starting on this topic, uh, let me say that I understand how sensitive and sometimes controversial it can be to revisit history. However, I do not believe that history uh, should be used as some kind of tool to enact vengeance or excessive finger pointing to uh, any, any group or any race. And if you accept, expect any kind of irrational anger from me or this platform, you will simply not get it. I strongly believe in the brotherhood and sisterhood of all of human beings. Regardless of the color of their skin, or the origin, their country of origin, or continent of origin. But I also know that it is very difficult uh, to establish genuine relationships when there are significant misconceptions or misunderstandings. So it is very important, in my opinion, to keep a constant look back at history while we're still moving ahead. Uh, this is what the Akan people of Ghana in West Africa called Sankofa. It is often symbolized by a bird. And as you can see from the, the image, you'll see that the bird is marching forward. His feet are planted in marching forward. However, sometimes its head is turned backward. So this symbolizes that as we march forward, we should never forget the knowledge of the past. Uh, because learning from the past ensures a strong future. Now, unfortunately, many factors over time prevented most of the world to know the true history of Africa and appreciate its contribution to humanity. For example, uh, there is the factor of slave trade. Uh, now, what is often discussed about trans transatlantic um, slave trade is that it robbed Africa of significant manpower that would be needed to continue advancing the continent just as manpower was needed uh, during the Industrial Revolution in Europe. But what is often not discussed uh, is that the uh, slave trade also robbed Africa of the ability to communicate uh, its contribution to the history of humanity. Because once the slave trade took hold, the voice of Africans became muted. The word was taken away from Africans and so theories were developed and uh, you had pseudo-intellectuals that relegated African or the entire continent, as a matter of fact, uh, to the state of savagery, uh, as if the continent did not have well-established and technologically advanced societies which 
today we know was the, was the case. And, and thankfully, uh, we have all the research that has been done in archaeology, in history, in anthropology. So African history has now resurfaced. We know that before the slave trade, uh, the African continent was developing normally. And you had advanced societies that were being formed. There were significant cultural and economic exchanges between Africa and other continents in true brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, you can look at the writings of several travelers uh, who went across Africa and who always marveled at what they saw in different African kingdoms. For example, uh, we now have the writing of the uh, 14th century Moroccan traveler called uh, Ibn Battuta, uh, who, by the way, traveled more than any other explorer in pre-modern history. He, he traveled for about 73,000 miles, which is more than the uh, popular uh, Chinese explorer Zhang He, who traveled about 31,000 miles. Or also we have the Italian explorer Marco Polo, who traveled about 15,000 miles. So uh, Ibn Battuta, and also many other written sources, described, for example, the now celebrated Mansa Musa, uh, who's a great king of the Malian Empire in West Africa, who's believed to be the wealthiest person who has ever lived, and who single-handedly lowered the value of gold because he distributed so much of it. So the list goes on and on. But unfortunately, sl the slave trade and later colonially really changed the relationship uh, and exchanges between Africa and other continents by turning them into toxic and destructive relationships. So a striking example of that is we have a series of 24 letters uh, that were written between the king of the Congo Empire, Nzinga Bemba, who uh, later adopted the Christian name of Alfonso I, so he wrote these letters with the king of Portugal, uh, Joao III uh, at the time. So in these letters that are dating back to the 15th century, uh, the two rulers sometimes actually call each other brothers. But in those letters, uh, King Nzinga Bemba is increasingly unhappy because the relationship between the two countries, Congo and Portugal, had degenerated from a relationship that was initially based on trade to a relationship where now slave trade became the priority. Because we have we had Portuguese soldiers that were kidnapping several people and sending them into slavery, and these included family members of the king himself. So these letters, uh, this is just an example of many stories that unfortunately have been left out of all of our history classes. The point is that the slave trade gradually robbed Africa of the ability to share its rich knowledge and history with the world, but it also prevented the world from knowing how developed African societies were before being decimated. At the same time, Africans that are born, who were born after the slave trade, were also prevented from knowing their own real history. For example, most people today know about the Wall of uh, the Great Wall of China, which is about 12,000 miles. But how many people know about the Great Walls of Benin that surrounded the Kingdom of Benin in West Africa in the 11th century? It would appear that very few people actually know about this significant and very important uh, vestige. According to estimates, the, the Benin city walls were at some point four times greater than the Great Wall of China. Four times. And it consumes a hundred times more material than, for example, the Great Pyramid of Cheops. The wall connected about 16,000 kilometers and it stood for 400 years before being destroyed by the British Army in 1897, so in the 19th century. So according to the 1974 uh, Guinness Book of Record, the wall of Benin City and its surrounding kingdoms was described as the world's largest earthworks carried out prior to the mechanical era. I see the lack of African of knowledge in African history 
is really a massive problem for humanity. It is really a shame that our education systems have denied most of us from such significant history. So whether you're of African origin, of African descent, or even non-African, you should be revolted because that history is part of all of our heritage as humans. I can look at my own case. I was born in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, left the country when I was around five years old, uh, spent a few years in, in Tanzania and East Africa, and moved to Belgium where I completed all my secondary education before later moving to the United States uh, where I completed my, my bachelor's and master's uh, and degrees. Well, I can assure you that as I was going through the formal education systems in Africa, in Europe, and in the United States, at no time did I learn about the specific of African history. And that's from somebody who actually loved history classes. I mean, I could recite facts about the Roman Empire history, about Greek mythology, uh, the Iliads of uh, Homer, the Odyssey of Homer, a Trojan War, the Italian Renaissance, etc., etc. Uh, but if you ask me about the Great Walls of Benin, I would have looked at you like a deer in a headlight, not knowing what you were talking about, not a single clue. Now, even though I am not Greek, I definitely do not regret, and I love the fact that I learned about the Iliad or the Odyssey of Homer. It is a fantastic story. However, I deeply re regret that my history classes did not teach me about Mansa Musa, the great king of the Malian Empire, who was the wealthiest person who ever lived. We're learning about the uh, uh, 17th century Queen Zinga, for example, uh, of the kingdom of uh, Ndongo and Matamba, which is now uh, northern Angola. I knew nothing of any of these important historical figures until I stumbled upon some sources and I took the personal initiative to educate myself on African history. You might think that my case is normal because I was mostly educated outside the continent, the African continent, but the same is true for those who grow up in Africa. For the most part, uh, the education systems are still relying on curriculum structures that were developed during colonization. The same is also true for many Africans in the diaspora, whose ancestors left the continent uh, 400 years ago. You see, for too long, uh, African Americans and other Africans in the diaspora were taught that their history began with slavery, when in reality, they are descended of proud kings, proud queens, and powerful kingdoms going back hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. The problem is very deep. Because, see, when we are taught as kids that Africa is Ibi Sunt Leonis, or a land of savages that did not contribute anything meaningful to human civilization, well, that lingers in our brains. And as we grow up, that contributes to creating subconscious biases and sometimes discriminatory prejudices, and those will impact our interactions. So it is important to remember the Sankofa concept that I mentioned earlier. We must obviously continue marching forward. But as we do so at the same time, we must also have our heads turned backwards. And that will help us gain knowledge from the past. And if we use it in, in, in a meaningful and in an intelligent way, that will help us build stronger futures. Now, the thing about the Africa platform is that from the get-go, we say that we do not want to be just uh, a platform where we complain or we state problems, but we want to provide solutions. So when it comes to learning about the history of Africa, uh, there are a few interesting sources that I would like to recommend and direct you to. I'll also provide the links in the uh, description of the YouTube channel, of the YouTube video. Now, uh, thankfully, with technology today, uh, you no longer have to study African history at university uh, to, to learn about the topic. You know, I mean, once you decide, you can essentially find all the information online. And I would strongly recommend that as you educate yourself on this topic, 
do not keep the knowledge to yourself, uh, but spread it within your network uh, so that over time, uh, ignorance and misconception about African history might be corrected. We all deserve it, in my opinion. Humanity deserves it. So I would recommend the uh, following sources to learn more about uh, Africa's real history. First, there is the um, General History of Africa, uh, so GHA. So this was a two-phase project launched in 1964 by UNESCO. Uh, UNESCO is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So phase one of uh, the two-phase project began in 1964 and only ended in 1999. And this consisted of uh, writing and publishing eight volumes which highlight the uh, heritage of Africa, of the people of Africa. And uh, phase two of the project, uh, which began in 2009 and it's still ongoing, uh, focuses on creating um, a history curriculum and teaching materials for school and universities uh, in Africa and in the diaspora as well. And this obviously based on the uh, eighth volume of the uh, GHA, the first, first uh, phase. So ultimately, the objective of uh, both phase one and phase two of the project is to reappropriate the interpretation and writing of African histories and to demonstrate the contributions of uh, African cultures, past and present, uh, to the history of humanity at large. So uh, I have to say that the uh, eight volumes are massive, okay? Each one is around 900 pages. Uh, I've been going through them uh, for a while, and they've been a great learning source. Uh, I'm actually thinking about developing short summaries uh, to help most of you who might not have the time to go through uh, every volume individually. Uh, however, I understand that you know some of you might cringe when you hear that there is a series consisting of uh, eight volumes of 900 pages each, which is roughly about uh, 7,200 pages. Uh, so you might definitely think that that's too too many pages. So if you prefer a short video or visual material, uh, I also have a few interesting sources that you might find useful and interesting. Well, the first such source is actually the uh, Cameroonian journalist called Alain Foucault. I'm a huge fan of his work. He has become a household name in French-speaking audiences uh, for all his work around Africa and the diaspora. So his work is usually transmitted through the uh, French channels uh, RFI, Radio France Internationale, and uh, France 24. But you can also find him on, on YouTube by searching his show called uh, Archives d'Afrique, or African Archives. So the interesting thing about his show is that he does not only focus on ancient African history, but contemporary history. So he, he has become associated with an interesting phrase, which he always likes to say, that says, Un peuple sans histoire est un peuple sans âme, which translates into uh, a people without history is a people without a soul. So Alain Foucault. Then there's also the series called uh, The History of Africa, which is led by the Sudanese-British journalist Zainab Badawi. Uh, so the History of Africa is an eight-part series, which was released by the BBC World News back in 2017. So in, in this series, uh, Zainab Badawi uh, visits several African locations uh, to uncover their history. The interesting part about this video series is that it is actually based on uh, UNESCO's project that I mentioned at first, which was the GHA, the General History of Africa. So you can find that on YouTube. Now, for those who enjoy art history, and I'm one of those, there is a series called The Lost Kingdom of Africa, which is led by the art historian, Dr. Gus Casey Hayford. So uh, in, in this series, which was also released by the BBC in 2013, uh, Dr. Gus Casey takes us around Africa as he explores pre-colonial history of some of Africa's most important kingdoms. Then there's also the, the YouTube channel, which is called Home Team History, uh, which has been online since 2013. Uh, this is an interesting channel because you will find short videos discussing African history, culture, and African worldview. Uh, this channel has a lot of insightful content and it's very, very easy to follow. It is definitely one of my favorite channels. 
And finally, obviously, we were here on our platform, AfriKiwi, uh, which we're still new and growing, uh, but we want to become one of your go-to sources uh, for accurate and relevant topics uh, from an African perspective. So there you have it. There are so many sources that can help you become more knowledgeable and might inspire you to join the Pan-African causes or movement. But one thing is true, uh, the revolution and changes that we're seeking cannot be done by one person or one movement. It can only be done by collective effort. That is why the Afrikili platform strongly advocates working in coalition, because we need to pool our resources aggregate our effort. So I'm really asking you to join the African movement. This is a grandiose dream for unity across the African world. So even if you're already part of another movement or leading one, I'm still asking you that we work in coalitions. Because if we get this right, our actions will echo for generations and we will be known as the generation that finally put Africa back on the map and back on track towards unity, prosperity, towards the United States of Africa. So whether you were born on the African continent, or born in the diaspora, or even relocated after your birth, or maybe your ancestors were taken out of the continent hundreds of years ago, you are still so important and essential for this to work. So I'm humbly asking you to join the cause. Join the Afrikan movement. Join the Afrikan coalition. Join the fight and the struggle for the United States of Africa. Thank you very much for your attention. And before closing, I would like to remind you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Afrikan. But also uh, sign up with your email on our blog at www.afrikan.com. And finally. Please uh, like and follow our social media feeds, uh, which you can find on Facebook, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and on Twitter. I really, really look forward to meeting all of you and working with you. I would like to join with you in this journey towards a better Africa and a better world. Can we really pull it off? Yes, we can. It will happen. I have this dream. So here we go. Let's get to work. Africa Kitty, African Intelligence, Building New Africa. Peace, be with you.